Now it's time for our scripture reading, and Hugh Worley is going to read our scripture. It's found in Romans 12, verses 9 to 18. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. And weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Thank you, Hugh. Now our own Dave Stenhouse is going to have our, ser our sermon. Wow, Carolee said our own Dave Senhouse. I, I didn't know that you had another one tucked away somewhere, Carolee. But I am glad to be here, glad to be able to be here. Glad that my sweet loving wife is here as well. And almost as much as that, Glad to see each one of you, although I'll admit, some more than others, you know. Just teasing you. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, as we come to this moment of our service where it is time to hear a message from you, I pray, Lord, that I have not misheard from you and that the message that I have prepared is indeed the message that you have asked me to prepare as I believe that it is. This is something that has been burning within me for a very long time and a, and a message I have resisted, but uh, I can resist no longer. So, Lord, I ask that you will send your spirit here to guard each heart, that you will free us from distraction, that we will incline all of our ears, mine most of all, to hear your word. So I pray in Jesus' name, amen. One of the many awesome things that Lisa has done just today is to get halfway out to the car and then realize that this was upstairs on the printer. And I had not gone upstairs to take it off of the printer, which means that if she didn't go back inside and get it off the printer, you guys would still be wondering what happened to me because I'd still be trying to get upstairs to get it off the printer. So thank you again, sweetie. So friends, as I, as you probably heard me pray, and now you're all going, oh boy, it's 20 minutes at 12, and he's wound up with a fastball, we can tell. It's not really like that, and I'm prepared to cut it short, because I got a discipleship class to do after the service, and I can't hang out here until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I will absolutely pass out. So you're all... 
either lucky or cursed to have to come back and hear the rest of it some other time. We'll see, we'll see how it goes. As Jeff and Carol Lee, Brian, anybody who is, um, uh, Kevin, anyone who has um, been asked to, to do this, like, you know, put on your, you know, and uh, stand up here and, 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 and deliver a message, it's a, it's a stressful thing, and it, because it's a, it's a, yeah, hey, right there with you, buddy. Um, yeah, I'd do that too if I could. Somebody roll me out of here, ooh, I'll cry. Um, <clears throat> it's a big responsibility, and it's, uh, um, it's something that if we try to, it's like anything else in the Christian experience, if we try to do it in our own steam, our own strength, it ain't going to work. Um, but here we are. So, what I try to do is no matter what I want to present, pray about it, pray about it some more, do some reading, do some praying, do some reading, do some praying, do some be still and know that I am Godding, and then get that ding, here it is, here's your message, and it's straight from the Bible, and I can present it to you straight from the Bible, I don't need any other sources, um, I'm just kind of a sola scriptura kind of dude, all right? And I've resisted ever speaking on a topic like the one that I'm going to speak about today for a couple reasons. Um, and the big one is that I can't really talk about this without bringing in some uh, extra biblical research. And one of the things that I that occurred to me after a lot of study and a lot of praying and a lot of, nah, this can't be right, is when I read the writings of Paul, and I read like the book of Romans, I read a lot of things where Paul is just saying, look, this is what the Lord said, this is what Paul has said, right? And, you know, there it is. Sometimes this is what the scriptures have said, quoting from the Old Testament, and sometimes this is what the Spirit has said to me, and sometimes it's just Paul saying, look, look, this is me, Paul, I'm just kind of giving you my advice, right? And I said, well, if Paul did that, and now it's part of the Bible, and I'm really sure that God is asking me to deliver this message, then, well, I, yeah, I'm a little taller now, huh, Jeff? You had to raise it up. Yeah, that's right. Um, I got myself all distracted, discombobulated. Let's not get there. Um, the other reason is that uh, although I kind of knew a lot about what, was, what I got to talk about here, what we're going to get into, um, uh, I, I didn't really have words, you know, and, and as you know, that, that words are usually not something I have a problem coming up with, so um, let's get up to it. Let's get, let's get into it here. I want to introduce you to a guy I went to college with. Um, this guy grew up in a small town, uh, the small town of Ranburn, Alabama. Um, Ranburn is a sprawling metropolis. It's about 400 people just west of the Georgia line. And uh, let's see here. Am I turned on? I can do like that. There's Billy. And uh, over on the left, the smiling Billy, that's uh, not a Jedi Billy. And uh, on the right there, that is uh, Billy dressed up as a Jedi. I don't know which one, if it's one in particular. If they had Jedis named Billy, I don't know. The um, only one I know is Obi-Wan Kenobi. And uh, he is no Alec Guinness, as you can see. But Billy grew up poor as Job's turkey in Ranburn, Alabama. And if his life through elementary school, junior high, high school, had taken him the way of uh, most of the people from Ranburn, he would have... Um, Maybe graduated from high school, maybe not graduated from high school. He'd have gone to work in the mill before it closed down. Um, any of this kind of sound familiar to some of the small towns around here? It's all the same, right? 
Um, and once the mill shut down, well, he'd had to scratch for something. But Billy was a little different. As you see there, I have written up there at the top, former Presidential Merit Scholar. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the Presidential Merit Scholar, I know that the only reason I'm familiar with it is because I met Billy in college and he was one. They certainly, um, no president, the president of the Dog Catcher Society wasn't coming to see me. But Billy was able to attend Sanford University, which is a um, pretty uh, uh, high academic standard, if you will, um, school in Birmingham, Alabama. It is uh, affiliated with um, either the Southern Baptist Convention or, I don't know, one of the Baptist things. Um, I went there for three years and I'm not really sure, so take it for what it's worth. Um, whereas he was offered a full ride, I was allowed to show up for one semester, admitted under academic probation, because they were pretty sure that they were going to be able to flunk me out by Christmas and never have to see my sorry butt again. Um, as it is, I actually made it a little bit longer than Billy did, and I want to tell you why. The full ride to Stanford University is a $16,000 a year in tuition, and he had his uh, room and board paid for as well. But, and you all know about how old I am, the internet wasn't what the internet is, all right? But Billy, being one of these smart guys, he got, he, he was a little socially awkward. I don't know if you can guess that by the fact that he's in his mid-40s, dressed up in a Jedi outfit. But, um, you know, there it is. But in college, Billy uh, got into to Usenet, which is kind of what nerds used to do um, when they were the only people out on the Internet. And uh, he was interested in these, like, chat rooms and, you know, he discovered very early on that on the internet, particularly before webcams, you were who you said you were. And you were as cool as you said you were. Or, you know, as you came across, maybe. Um, but if you maybe, you know, felt a little awkward in your own skin, you didn't have to worry about that. All the smooth lines that you were never able to get out when talking to a real girl, you could get out because it's coming out of your fingers. And he got into that. And I don't know if he got into like internet girls or not, but what I do know is that um, he got so into it that if he ever showed up to a class, it would only be long enough to put his head down on his desk and fall asleep because he'd be up all night in the, computer, in the computer lab, because I don't know about his children. Like, not everybody had computers, you know? Like, even at, you know, rich boy school, not everybody had computers. We all had to, like, and if you had a computer, you wouldn't have been able to do anything with it as far as, like, getting on the Internet, because you had to get a mainframe terminal in order to, to get on. I mean, I'm old, I guess. But, <clears throat> anyway free ride to a prestigious university, and he flunked out. Because apparently, you have to show up at class, and you have to, uh, you know, take a test every now and again. And if you don't do that, they don't let you stay. And I gotta tell you, Billy's a nice guy. Nicest guy, one of the nicest guys I've ever met. Give you a shirt off his back, although you wouldn't want to put it on. But the last I knew, he was, uh, he had gone back to Ranburn, you know, tail between his legs, I guess, I don't know. I don't know what he told people about the big city, Birmingham. But last I knew that he, he was working as a, as a DJ, not at a radio station, not that kind of DJ, like at a, like a, like a, a you know, high school party kind of DJ or like a, like a wedding reception DJ. Um, it was just another job that is uh, quickly being replaced by computers. He was in a little town somewhere, somewhere near Anniston, Alabama. If you guys know your Alabama geography, it's just a little northwest of where he grew up. Um, but hey, 
last I knew, he was happy, as productive, and as close to being well-adjusted as, uh, as he ever was, I guess. Well, why don't I tell you about Billy? Y'all ain't never going to meet Billy. Unless it's in heaven, you're never going to meet Billy. Because I don't think he's ever going to get out of Alabama, and y'all ain't never going to Ramburn, Alabama. You wouldn't break down in Ramburn, Alabama. I tell you, you push your car across the Georgia line to make sure that you don't break down in Ramburn, Alabama. I'll tell you that. Well, back in 1994, <clears throat> when, uh, oh, 1993 is when I met Billy, 1994 is when he flunked out. But the internet was barely a thing at all, like I was saying. Now, you know, Tim Berners-Lee, who some of you, you recognize that name, you know, makes your heart beat proud, you know. He had just created HTML. He just created the concept of a URL and uh, all the other things that make um, the internet work the way that we all know it to work today. But um, I think Sanford had like two computers that had, you know, a mouse and, and, a, and a display that had graphics. Everything else was, you know, just like a you know, 800 by 600 text thing, right? And that, that magical mosaic browser was, was nowhere to be found. Only the, the real, only the guys that were going to grow up to be, you know, bald dudes with ponytails uh, and dressing up as Jedis really understood how to, how to get on the Internet and socialize and hang out and, and have friends and stuff. And uh, it was difficult. I mean, I, I, I tried like once, maybe twice, just to see what all the hubbub was about. And I was like, you know what? There's, there's a party across campus right now. They got real girls over there. So, see you! I'm out. And uh, I kind of figured, rightly, I think, that the people that were uh, doing that were the people that just, you know, like Billy, they just, just for whatever reason, they're kind of awkward and, and uh, had trouble doing that in, in real life. So obviously things have come a long way since then, right? We got, I live between here and Siler City, and last year I got fiber optic internet. Right? Of course, the year before that, I was lucky if I could get five meg down trying to, oh, man. Try to have a video conferencing lab like that. It don't work, all right? I'm just telling you, it doesn't work. But things have come a long way since then. Remember, we always get to go to those AOL CDs in the mail. You know, before you got AOL CDs in the mail, you used to get AOL floppy disks in the mail, right? I, I made my way through college with them little three and a half inch uh, floppy disks from AOL. I never had to buy a, a, a disk, you know? And I'm kind of taking a couple shots at my buddy Billy, and, and I shouldn't do that, and I know, but I mean, you know, with the college with a guy, you know, everybody kind of busts on everybody in college, and you know, it's a long time later, but I just, here it is, you know, I'm sorry, Billy. But the reason that I'm showing you Billy and talking about something that happened this long ago is that Billy probably wasn't the first person to kind of throw their life or at least their big shot away. Come on now. Hey, Jeff, I just lost, uh, I guess I've been standing here too long. Oh, there it is, it's back. All right. Um, he's not the first, probably not the first. He might have been the first that died. Probably not the first, definitely not the last. There have been any number of people who have um, really just dive in head first on this uh, internet thing, get tied up, get, get sucked in, and then never kind of find their way clear. Anybody uh, recognize that? That logo there? Seen it before? Once or twice? The Googster! Hey, wake up. So it was just a couple years after Billy flunked out, and uh, about the time that I dropped out, that's what happens when you uh, leave school without graduating or flunking out. Um, a guy named Larry Page 
met a guy named Sergey Brin at Stanford University. Sergey was a PhD student. Larry was just trying to decide if he wanted to pursue his PhD at Stanford. They got together. They didn't really like each other at first. They butted heads and argued all the whole time. But eventually, they decided that they were good for each other. And uh, while working on their PhDs together, they founded Google. And uh, you may not know this, but kind of like the legend of the fifth beetle, there was a third guy that founded Google. Actually, the guy that did all the work for the first iteration of the Google search engine. Uh, unfortunately for that guy, or fortunately, I suppose, it all depends on your priorities, um, he decided that he, he was kind of done uh, with Google and about, I don't know, a few months before they actually formed a company. And uh, as such, he's lost out on any numbers of tens of billions of dollars. So, you know, hope he's, hope he's happy. So uh, Google's doing pretty good financially. I don't know if you're aware of this. Any, anybody heard of Google? I know, like I have. I know Ricky has. I know Dev has. Dev had never has because she's a, like a, a vice president of IT or something like that or, or you know, like, uh, I think people have to salute her when she walks into her office, but she never heard of Google, so, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing. I don't know how you did it, Deb, but great. Um, in 2006, the, the two founders, they're, uh, um, Larry and Sergey, they, they went half-seas on a Boeing 767. Now, I know a couple fairly rich people, and none of them own a plane, I heard tell of a couple very rich people that own a plane. I don't know anybody that owns half of a 767, all right? Well, I know, like, I know of two people that own half of a 767. I don't know them, never met them. But uh, I'm sure if I ever was standing in front of them, they'd expect me to, like, park their car or shine their shoes or something. But, uh, yeah. It's, uh, it was a used 767. I don't want anybody to think that these two guys are very extravagant or anything like that. It was a used 767, okay? And uh, 767, as originally, um, when Boeing rolled it out, it uh, seated about 200 people. But uh, after they put a couple of king-size beds in the back for each of them and whoever they're traveling with, um, and the couches, you know, they could only... Oh, and the, uh, they got hammocks in there now, too. They got... Because I think if you want to have fun, be in a hammock when you hit the turbulence, that would be awesome. They can only seat 50 people, and chances are none of us are ever going to be up. Well, except for Deb, none of us are ever going to be up on the 50 people. But that's 2006. If you back up seven years in 1999, these two guys... Um, tried to sell Google to another search engine called Excite. Anybody remember Excite? they long gone now. They offered to sell Google to Excite for a million dollars, and they got laughed out of the room. And uh, they came back, and they said, well, how about $750,000? And uh, Excite said, I don't think you heard us laughing hard enough the first time, kids. Get out. What changed? Why would, I mean, listen, if I had something I could sell for a million dollars, I'd be feeling all right about that. You, sweetie? Yeah? You'd be all right with that? Yeah? You, would you still stay married to me? All right. Well, you, I love you. I love you. I hope, you're, I hope you're not lying. But a couple things changed. When they were the young, idealistic PhD students, <clears throat> they wanted Google to be pure. Pure is the driven snow. You got a question, pop it in, Google's going to give you an answer. I'm waiting for somebody to say, hey, Dave, ain't that what Google does? I need somebody to say that. Hey, Dave, ain't that, if you want to use proper grammar, hey, Dave, isn't that what Google does? Somebody? Anybody? Hey, Dave, isn't that something that Google does? No. But they didn't want advertising at all in 1998. They actually wrote a paper talking about 
why they didn't want to put advertising in there. And, uh, you know, after the venture capitalists start coming around and, and start, you know, dumping briefcases full of cash on them and saying, <clears throat> guys, you got a great thing here, but what's your business model? These are young, idealistic PhD students. They don't know what a business model is. What's your business model, boys? You got to have a business model. And so they said, well, I guess a little, a little advertising couldn't hurt too bad, but we will only allow a line of text for an ad. Just text. We like that clean look. Don't throw pictures everywhere confusing people. Give them an ad, but it's just going to be a one ad, one line of text. And that, that worked, you know, that worked for a little bit. That, 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 got, to, uh, that got them from 1998, 1999, and 2000. And I want to be clear, I don't have a problem with a company making money. And if a company's got a great product and they make a lot of money and they earned it fair and square and honestly, this is what I do. I stand back and applaud them and I go, hey, you know, I wish I could come up with something that would be awesome like that. They got to make a profit. They got to pay the people, right? You got to have insurance. You got to put the lights on. You got to do all these things. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. you want to make a profit, make a buck, make a buck. But in 2007, uh, these, these, this, is like a little, this is like a little taste of sin, all right? This kind of gets in your life and it kind of opens up that little crack. There's a, Ricky had a great uh, analogy to use in Sabbath school this morning, talking about when you get the, the, the young mule and, the, and you're going to yoke them with the old one, right? There's another one that I'm going to give you. It's talking about, you know, the camel sticks his nose under the tent flap, right? Once he gets his nose in, next thing you know, you got a camel standing in the tent with you. You can't keep him out once the nose is in. This is what kind of happened to these guys once they got a taste of real money. In 2007, Google bought DoubleClick which was a uh, company that did a lot of um, uh, tracking using something you might have heard of called cookies. Um, and, and I don't have time to get into all the different ways that, that Google can slice and dice all the, everything that they know about you, but they know more about you than you know more about yourself. They know more about you than your spouse knows about you, than your mama knows about you. They know you. I'm going to talk a little bit about how and why they know you. And here's the thing. I think a lot of people say, hey, Google wants to drop an ad for me, and they know me, they know what I like, so they're not going to waste my time on an ad for something I'm not interested in. What's the problem? The problem is that they don't pop that ad at you willy-nilly. Just you know, hey, James has been on this website twice now. Let's give him an ad for something. I, I think he likes to collect My Little Ponies. Let's give him a My Little Pony ad. Oh, now we know James. He doesn't collect My Little Ponies. That's Deb. And we'll give James a, uh, you know, something uh, very uh, austere and mechanical. Right? And it happens to be just the thing James was about to do an internet search for. And he's like, oh, man. They save so much time. I love it. It's not how it works. They're able to tell by what time it is, when you're online, what you're doing at that time, what your history is, if you're out of you know, your normal routine, if you seem to be stalking your ex on social media. They, they tell all these things. And they're able to determine exactly when the right time is to pop a given ad in front of you to make you the most likely to click on that ad. This is a little bit of magic that, uh, that we call wrong, where I come from. It's manipulation. Um, so. <clears throat> Uh, 
when you're using the front part of your brain to do a, a thing, you're pretty much immune to this. When you're bored, when you're lonely, when you're melancholy for some reason, you are very, very susceptible to this. So, if you're bored, lonely, melancholy, something, stay off of the Googster. Just stay off. In 2018, DuckDuckGo, which uh, offers an alternative to, to Google's targeted directed ads, uh, conducted a small study, and it's really too small to, to say that this is, uh, you know, numerically uh, faux show, but um, in this study, they had volunteers in America, all at a given specific time, do a search for three terms, gun control, immigration, and vaccinations. It's 2018, no COVID, don't anybody get all riled up. Gun control, immigrations, vaccinations, 9 p.m. Eastern on a Tuesday night. I'm sorry, on a Sunday night, Sunday, June 24th, 2018. The volunteers performed the searches in two different ways. They logged out of Google on their browser. If they were using a Chrome browser, they log out of Google, put it in incognito mode, which is that mode that Chrome tells you is how you are uh, protected and, and hidden from whoever might be looking at track you. And they search those three terms. And then they go back in a normal mode, go ahead and sign back in and do the same searches. 2018. And you can, you can refine the report online. You can go to DuckDuckGo. You can send me an email and ask me for it. I'll send it to you. Um, but there are others who have repeated the same experiment. As a matter of fact, Dr. Cato was by no means the first to do it, but they were the first that I know of to do it after Google said that they cleaned their act up. But what happened is what I, I just kind of told you was going to happen. The different people got different results. Sometimes you have the same you know, 10 results, but they're ranked in different order. And you go, well, that's no big deal, is it? Well, yeah, it's a big deal. How often do you click on the 10th rank thing in, a, in, a, in an internet search? If you're like the rest of us, you click on the second rank thing about half as many times as you click on the first rank thing. You click on the third rank thing about half as many times as you do the second rank thing, and on and on and on. And I'm not good enough at math off the top of my head to tell you how many times that says that you click on a 10th rank thing, but it ain't very often, I know that. So, incognito mode makes no difference. Might as well go ahead and not pretend that they're not tracking you anyway. So what, Dave? You've been talking for half an hour. What's the big whoop? Well, Here's the thing. We have a tendency, Western, the world over, I don't know any civilization doesn't have the same tendency, but we particularly, who are Christians, have a tendency to kind of just assume that everyone around us has heard all the same things that we've heard, that we've all seen the same news, right? Like, when I was a kid, my house was a Peter Jennings house. That was it. We didn't want to hear about no Ted Koppel in my house. My dad would throw you out if you said Ted Koppel. It's Peter Jennings here, or just turn the TV off. Or more than likely, he'd put your head through it, but man, whatever. I don't know how it was in your house. Back in the day, I don't think they didn't have the three guys. It was like two guys, right? Whatever. We had a shared... We all sat down at 6 o'clock and watched the news. And it doesn't really matter if you're watching Dan Rather, or Ted Koppel, or Peter Jennings. It's all the same news. And we all saw the same news. And so we all could reasonably believe that if I ran into you at work, 
around the old water cooler or something, I could mention something that I saw in the news last night, and you'd have seen it too. The sociologists call that a shared ethos or something like that. So I'll give you an example. Since, oh, since a very long time ago, around the time of Moses and Aaron, there is one little piece of scripture, and I've told you all this about this before, found in Deuteronomy 6. And this particular couple of verses has been recited every day, every day, since the time of Moses until earlier this morning. And here it is, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. And actually, if you're an Orthodox Jew, you go a lot further, but I'm going to stop here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thine soul, with all thine might. And these words which I command thee these day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when you sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. If you're a Jew back in the day, and if you're a practicing Jew today, you know this text. If you're above the age of 12, you've got it memorized in Hebrew and in whatever your native tongue is. Picture on the left there is a guy named uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan. He was a senator from Massachusetts, maybe New York. I can't remember. I mostly remember him from my father yelling at him on C-SPAN, but that was my dad. But he said something in 1983 that I heard him say in 1983, because, you know, my dad. And it has stuck with me since 1980, stinking three. What he said was, this is a very small piece of a much larger um, uh, commentary in which you, 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 you might make you want to cuss at somebody if you hear the whole thing, but don't. Um, so first get your facts straight. Everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not his own facts. Anybody ever heard that? You're entitled to your own opinion, you're not entitled to your own facts. Here, we, this, we all understand this, right? Daniel Patrick Moynihan in 1983 wasn't breaking new ground. They, he's not the next Aristotle because he said this. We know this. We intuitively understand this. The facts are the facts. Matter of fact, I, 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 um, a verse that I forgot to put in here, and I wanted to put it in here, but I forgot to put it in here, is found in uh, 1 Timothy, um, 1 Timothy chapter 3. In 1 Timothy chapter, chapter 3, uh, Paul writing to Timothy says, uh, verse 14 says, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So Paul says to Timothy, don't forget, young blood. You're in the house of God. The pillar and the ground of the truth. Truth is singular here, right? And we all intuitively understand this. Truth is singular. There is one set of facts. And we all got to decide to live with those facts. The problem is this. Google has made, they're at a valuation now of a couple of hundred billion dollars or something like that. I kind of quit counting. I, I, you know, ten fingers, ten toes. I, I can only take it so far. Um, you, can look, you want to look it up for me? Because I don't know. Oh, I thought, I thought you were going to look it up for me. I was like, okay, Deb, go for it. Um, you're the numbers cruncher. I don't know. <laughs> um, here's the problem. Google, other companies like Google, have curated 
what facts you will be exposed to so that you will see the things that will seem right to you based on what Google already knows about you. In other words, they know what your preconceived, preconceived notions are. They know how you see the world, that sort of lens that is unique to how you kind of understand the world around you. And they do not want to show you facts that counteract those things. So what happens? Well, what happens is you kind of get a big love, love, love right here. You get some Google love in your heart. They give me the good stuff. Oh, yeah. Nothing ever contravenes what I think. Oh, I can relax. And then you get out of your mom's basement, you go outside, and you run into somebody who has had a different set of facts curated for them. And then, although you may both speak English, you find it impossible to communicate because you no longer have a shared set of facts. You are no longer standing on the same ground as the truth. And if you watch a little TV, you know, whoever's doing the news these days, you'll see it. I, there, I, I, when I was driving all the time, many, many years ago, and it would be late in the evening, and I would be 400 miles from anywhere, and I'd turn the radio on just to try to stay awake, because I hadn't probably slept in a couple days. The only thing I could find on the radio is, like, crazy talk radio, right? Like, not even, oh, not even, like, normal talk radio, like the, the, the real cuckoo bird talk radio. And depending on what time of night it was, you would find out who is us and who is them. And somehow or another, them was always some unreasonable group that you just can't talk to them. They just, they just want to like, live with their lives. But fortunately, we're us. So it's all good. But at 8 o'clock at night, us is one bunch, and at midnight, it's a whole different bunch. I'm confused. But this is the deal. One other thing that I meant to put up on the thing, and, and I, I, uh, I lost where I saved the graph to. Um, but I have a graph somewhere that shows uh, how many of the Internet's biggest websites, the million biggest websites on the Internet as of, I don't know, whenever, this, whenever the study was done, has trackers on it from Google. 75% of the million biggest websites. And um, you've been on at least a few of them. In a distant second is Facebook with about 30%, I think. And uh, running hind dog in third is Amazon. Of course, Amazon hosting all those websites, so they're getting it on the other end. So, um, yeah. So, here's the deal. If we keep living with our own sorts of facts, with our own dealios, and if we continue to assume that we all are operating from the same sheet of music, we're going to continue to be in this us and them where us are all right and them are heretics or worse. If we continue on being blind, thinking that companies like Google are doing us a favor by how they curate search results and how they sell us stuff that we don't need or want, except that uh, there's the ad and 
I just happen to be emotionally ready to not even think about it and bye, 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 then we can continue to expect them to pocket billions of dollars while they keep us ignorant in our own prejudices. And this is to say nothing of the, uh, the uh, uh, what do they call it? When, when, uh, um, um, the disconnect with the, the uh, uh, boy. Eh, can't think of the word, never mind. These guys, they got a 767, I told you that, right? They're also going to like try to help you get down with, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, environmental stuff that you would think a person that wanted that so bad wouldn't have a 767. But here, here's the deal, guys. We're going to stop there because it's time to stop. I got a whole other section of bad news before we get to the good news. So, oh yeah, I actually had a couple more slides. Yes, how can we communicate and continue on this way? If we keep going this way, we're not going to finish the work that Jesus has set before us because we're going to be sitting here in church smug with ourselves or arguing at each other's throat while the world outside continues to go to hell. It will happen because... We think that we can't talk to them until they get on board with our facts. Is that what Jesus did? Did Jesus say, all right, look, lady, you got to quit messing around with every fool that walks through this town and get right with your husband, and then we can talk. That's not what he said. He said, I love you. I want to heal you. Now go ye therefore and sin no more. Right? When did Jesus ever refuse to deal with anybody? Because they're just not, just not seeing things the same way. And Jesus walked this earth. His disciples didn't even see, see things the same way that he did. And he loved them anyway. We've got an opportunity to get past all of this and to reach those who right now we just don't seem to be able to communicate with. But it will only happen if we are very, very aware of what we're doing when we're browsing web, social media. We're going to talk about social media a little bit next time. Um, when we're doing all those things, we need to understand that this is not a, uh, um, a, a service of the public good that, is, that, you're, that you're using and that you're being manipulated. We're going to talk about, um, I, I got something to tell you guys about next time that, uh, you know, even if you're, you're like Deb and you're like, all right, Dave, you said all this, I know all this. I got something for you, Deb, you may not know. Or you might, because I've never managed to trip you up yet. That's where we're going to stop right now. Friends, I appreciate your time. I apologize that this has been a little light on the Bible for what it usually is. But please understand that the only reason is that I see a world outside and they're not deciding to come in here to see what our facts are. And as long as we're in here, we're not going in there, out there, to see what their facts are. We can't wait for them to decide to come in. we got to go out. So let's sing a song, whatever it is that I said we were going to sing.